John Michael Howson has been involved in the Australian entertainment scene for more than 40 years as a writer, producer and performer. John Michael has done it all from working in the bush as a reporter to reporting from Los Angeles to writing some of Australia's musical blockbusters Shout and Dusty and now works on 3AW. But above all, John Michael Howson knows show business. First of all, John, welcome. Thanks, Mark. Sunraysia Daily, your first gig. Sunraysia Daily, Muldura, and I worked under a wonderful editor called George Tilly, and he was a hard taskmaster. You had to turn up with your stories and be well researched and well written, and he wouldn't brook any of, oh, she'll be right. So it made me very pedantic. I'm a terrible T crosser and I dotter. I, I have to check and double check on everything. And that all came from George, who if you had done the wrong thing, you would get a swift kick in the rear end. So what sort of stories did you uh, write on? I suppose Mother's Club meetings to Harvest? You, of course, that's what you start with. In the pickers that rolled up in the town? Yeah, you start off with... I started off doing river levels, the Murray River levels, <laughs> when there well, was water, right when there was water that's in the Murray right, yeah. River. Um, and then uh, the, the local interchurch uh, tennis matches, mm -hmm. uh, local cricket. Um, I graduated, I finished up being the movie reviewer. That's where I started to get interested in the whole film business because I became a member of the local film society. And I would also review local theatre. At the Astor? Would have been at the Astor Theatre in those days? The Mildura, they would get very old 1930s documentaries. <laughs> like Robert Flaherty's Nanook of the North, I mean, you know, whatever, barely with a soundtrack. But you learnt film from the ground up. You, I started to understand what film was about and saw some great classic films that nobody wanted to look at, like M with Peter Laurie and pictures that had been, you know, they'd been gathering dust for years in the archives. So that grounded me, but it all happened in Muldura. And you know, country newspapers are great because they actually give you the chance to do things that you would never get in a city newspaper. So I, I was very lucky. And then I got on to court reporting. And my, my grandfather, my step-grandfather, was a wonderful court reporter. He was one of the best in Australia. At that time, he was retired. And he would, he would ta taught me a lot about being a court reporter. Not that I ever wanted to be one, but the great thing that happened to me in Mildura, I did my first celebrity interview. I interviewed Chips Rafferty. Wow. An iconic Australian screen star. And he said something that was wonderful because the Australian film industry in those days was in, at death's door, you might say. And he said, Australia has so many great stories. It has so many great places to film. I want to see Australia depicted to the world in film. I was inspired by him, absolutely inspired by Chips Rafferty. So that started me, I suppose, you know, he was number one of about 2,000 celebrity interviews I've done. It's amazing. But from Mildura with the St. Racy Daily to writing for Graham Kennedy, yes. Mike Walsh, and then being part of the Mike Walsh show, how important was working in the bush and honing your writing skills to progressing to Graham Kennedy and, and Mike Walsh? Well, first of all, I, I suppose this comes from my... Celtic background. I had a bit of a sense of humour about, you know, I, I grew up in, as a kid with my uh, 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 Irish, Anglo-Irish Australian family and they never stopped talking, but they were very funny. And I started to look at news as being a source of great humour. I was, I was very cynical about a lot of stuff. Still am, which is great, because I, you know, I look at uh, politicians and think, do you really think people are going to believe that? And unfortunately people do. So I, I started to think in terms of sketch writing without doing it. And when I came to Melbourne, was working at the ABC newsroom, I met a young man called David Sale, who went on to create number 96. Mm. And David was writing for a, re a review in, in Melbourne at the St Martin's Theatre. And I said, oh, I'd love to do that. And I did, and it was successful. So that started my theatrical writing. Mm. Uh, through just sitting next to David in the horrible ABC newsroom. Graeme Kennedy, the, the king. Mike Walsh, I mean, king of daytime television. Yeah. He's still regarded as the king. You were a very important part of his show. Why did you, though, move to Los Angeles after when you, you had Australia at your uh -oh. fingertips? I w went to England before I went to Los Angeles. I lived there for five years. I wrote for Fashion Magazine. And that kept me commuting between London and Paris and Paris and London, whatever. But I 
still was mad about writing sketches and comedy, so I submitted sketches to various television shows and some of them were sold. I then started writing gag lines for comedians at, I think, £5 a pop, which was terrific, <laughs> considering my weekly wage was only like £25. I mean, £5 a pop was great. So I was writing all these gags. One day I woke up and thought, I can't stand another English winter. I'm going back to Australia. I came back here and I got a job at Channel 10, which was just beginning, and wrote a children's show called Magic Circle Club. The idea was it would entertain children on one level, and on the other level, adults would get the gag. So there was a, it, was, it was a double entendre. It was a know. great family show. It was great. And families loved it because mothers could sit with their children. The kids would be seeing the, the fantasy side. The mothers would be seeing the satirical side. And that led to Adventure Island. And uh, then Mike Walsh, uh, whom I knew, and was doing a Tonight Show in Melbourne. He said, can you write me some gags? I don't know how I fitted it in, but I did. Then one day um, I got a call from Graham. He was come, making a comeback to radio. Would I go and write his radio show? And it, I look, it all sort of snowballed from one thing to another. You don't know, you know what... You don't know what's going to happen. A door opens and another door opens. So I started to build this thing. But Mike Walsh said to me something. He said, you've got the gift of the gab, which is my Irish background. Why don't you come on on and the show and do your stories? Now, I had been appearing as characters in the children's shows, but no one ever saw my face. I was always in a mask. Don Lane had used me a bit, playing a character called Victor Venture. My God. <laughs> but I felt, OK, why not? So I went on and the, it didn't worry. I was so used to television, but taking the mask off didn't worry me. You know, I, I for the first time I was being seen as me, so to speak, and I was very relaxed. And I treated television as being, being in someone's living room. And so with a fund of gags and experiences. And then someone called up one day and said, there's a new James Bond film in Egypt. They were shooting some Spy Who Loved Me. Would you come and cover it? And I said, would I ever? Well, that started the ball rolling. And how, what actually happened, I think this was a little before the Mike Walsh show. I can't, I'm time, you know. But anyway, I went to Los Angeles and on my credit card, booked crews and hung around through contacts getting onto the sets of various movies. And I did, and I came back with a library of fabulous interviews with stars that were unattainable. I didn't, must have been my bright blue eyes or something and got me <laughs> through the door. And of course, people couldn't believe that I had all these people. And so it all, it all the Hollywood persona was created. After Mike Walsh left, I was doing the midday show with Ray Martin, and I wasn't really happy with it. I just felt that I was just, square peg in a round hole or a round peg in a square hole mm. or something. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. And I mentioned it to a friend of mine in Los Angeles on one of my film jaunts. He said, why don't you come over here? I said, oh, what would I do here? He said, come over. Something will happen. So I went over. And lo and behold, in no time, I was doing some stuff on the Joan Rivers show, Gordon Elliott show, doing freelance radio, as well as still doing stuff back to Australia. Mm -hmm. So suddenly Los Angeles became really interesting because I wasn't sitting in a cold water flat waiting for something to happen. I was actually out there. I was in film studios. I was covering the Oscars. I actually covered 23 Oscars from front of house, red carpet, backstage, you name it. I've done the whole thing. Mm. I've covered umpteen Grammys, Emmys, Tonys, whatever. I don't, I don't look at award shows now. I never want to see another award show as long as, unless I'm nominated. But it all became a very exciting situation mm -hmm. and I must say I kept pinching myself you're sitting down and interviewing people like Paul Newman or uh, Jack Nicholson or somebody from the past like mm -hmm. Betty Davis a screen legend um, or even some of the more current ones but it was it was amazing to me I used to think I can't believe this this is pe these are people that I've paid to go and see and here I am talking to them but 17 years in LA you've come back to Australia you got two musical blockbusters shout and dusty I mean, are you a writer? Are you a performer? Are you a journalist? How, how would you regard yourself? A bit of everything. I mean, the reason I, I you heard about my theatre background, I wrote all these mm. sketches. I, I had written a musical years ago about Melbourne in the 1920s. In those days, no producers were interested. Commercial producers weren't interested in taking up an Australian musical. But after The Boy From Oz came out, mm. and, and which was wonderful, and I thought, you know, Maybe Australian musicals have a chance now. Mm. And Nick Enright did a great job with it. And I thought, well, 
may be. So I, I said to a producer, you know, there is another great Australian story to be told. He said, what's that? And I said, it, it's uh, Johnny O'Keefe. Uh, the producer was Kevin Jacobson. And God bless his cotton socks. He said, yes, what a great idea. We'll get it on like next week. I mean, I cannot tell you how <laughs> David Mitchell and Melvin Morrow, with whom I wrote the show, I had no, known, we had talked about, wouldn't that be a great idea? And we couldn't believe that A, Kevin wanted to do it, and B, he wanted it done yesterday. So it was the fastest on stage production in the history of the theatre. Turned out to be a smash hit. So the big thing is, okay, you have one smash hit, what are you going to do next? And David said, I've just been reading a wonderful book about Dusty Springfield, what about that? So Dusty was written, and Dusty is a hit. It's going to be an international production. It's going everywhere, New York and, well, hopefully, but certainly all the provincial tours and in Canada and state tours in America, uh, then London and whatever. So we're, that's moving on. I have now written a musical with my cousin Frank Housen based on the life of Bobby Darren mm. called Dream Lover and that's heading for a production in America in the foreseeable future. American producers read it and loved it. So that's that part of it. Mm. Right, okay. The journalist part of me I suppose comes out that I am now on a top rating radio show in Melbourne by accident. I never looked for it. And double the ratings too on a Sunday morning. It, it's now the number one rating show on Melbourne radio mm. in, on a Sunday morning. It's time slot. And um, so that's the journalist side of me coming out. Why is it so popular now? I mean, it can't just be you, or is it, has it become entertaining? Well, you have to entertain. A lot of people forget this. I have worked with people who think that they're very profound and therefore must bore the socks off people because they want to show how serious they are. I believe you can take a serious subject and make it entertaining. I learned a lot from American radio. Australian radio is still, in many ways, people are terribly serious. A lot of people I've talked, there are exceptions like Darren Hinch and whatever, but it, and there are, I Darren. mean, you, you take, yeah. you know, he plays it, he's he plays it like he does. He's entertaining. He's, he's entertaining. And then you take people in, in like Alan Jones, is incredibly entertaining mm. to listen to, and and they that's why they're very successful. I believe you have to have a, an opinion, not be scared to voice that opinion, if 99% of people disagree with you, tough. You still have to have your own sense of what you feel is right and wrong. Um, don't be frightened by authority or authority figures or government mm -hmm. because that in Australia, this unhealthy respect for people for whom you, I mean, you voted for them, but they don't own you, you own them because they're paid to do the job for you. And there's this sort of taller, we're, we're, we're like, you know, peasants in, in ancient Europe. Surf to surfs in Europe, you know, tugging the forelock with a politician. No, as far as I'm concerned, I, you do something to earn my respect. But if you're not earning my respect, I'm not going to sit there and, in, in any way, shape or form. I mean, I had a big argument with somebody from a major sporting authority who talked bunkum. Now, for years, people have been going, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so. And I thought, you were an idiot. So I'm going to out you as an idiot. And you know something? We got thousands and thousands of, of, of the phones blew up thousands of emails, letters, people say, thank God someone's done that. Okay, I'm a, a little bit biased, but what's wrong with Australian television or the entertainment industry at the moment? What's our, the latest blockbuster film that's come out? There is, hasn't been one. Why? Oh, too much government interference. Too, much, too many people looking for a grant. Too many people not. We, I have never taken a cent in government money in my life. No, I won't call it government money, taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. I will not, because they sort of own you. you know, you've got to go through such BS with all these authorities. You've got to keep filling out forms and sending. I don't want those people. The only person I want to talk to is a producer. Mm -hmm. I'll take his advice. I'll see, you know, that's, that's fair enough. But not these people sitting in some office and you don't know where they've come from. Mm -hmm. And usually you don't know where they've gone because they're, it's like a revolving door of ineptitude. So it's more like a charity than, than it a business. It is. People who are unable to cut it in the real world looking for taxpayers to s subsidise their way of life. You don't subsidise people running a 7-Eleven if it doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. You don't subsidise people with a restaurant if it doesn't do any good. To me, it's a, your chosen way of employment. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do that, get out there in the marketplace. The difference of show business in Australia compared to show business in the US? 
in America it is a business and it's a business in the United Kingdom as well in many ways. I mean, I'm not against subsidising the National Theatre Company or the State Opera or the whatever. I mean, the, the, the high, f- high form of art is very expensive and there wouldn't be any producers going to risk doing that. that. That's a different kettle of fish. I'm talking about subsidising artists to paint pictures no one wants to buy or books that no one wants to read. That sounds like I'm a Philistine. I'm not because I think out of, out of the need, out of the hunger comes great work. You start off off Broadway and graduate to off Broadway and then get to Broadway. You must be doing something right. And the same right across regional theatres in the United States. Or the thing that I loved in Los Angeles were what they call equity waiver theatres, where there were small theatres seating around 100 and young writers, young well, actors, whatever, would go there and work for next to no money so their work could be seen. If you were to give advice to say an individual that wants to get into show business, wants to be an entertainer. What advice would you give? What, what advice? Oh golly, well I would say And it's an open ended Be prepared question, for yeah. disappointment. You know, that's that's number one. You you know rejection is mm. see you've got to be prepared to be rejected. And a lot of people aren't. That that's the thing. You know, it it it's tough and it it really is so ego crushing. Mm. But if you really want to do it, nothing will stop you from doing it. It is very hard in Australia now because we don't have the small review theatres that trained a lot of talent when I was around. What do you really have in films are, for the most part, awful through bad writing and themes that nobody's interested in. If you have to go and sing in the street to get people to listen to you, go and do it. If you want to be an actor and you're not going to get into NIDA or one of the drama schools, join your local theatre company. You know, I've talked to young people, say, oh, I want to be an actor. And I've given them the advice of, yes, go to your local drama school, go to your local amateur theatre company, learn to, to sell tickets, and move the sets around, go in, maybe you'll get a bit part in a production get involved in the business of theatre. Mm. They all look at me and they say, how do I get into Neighbours? Because that's the problem. They want to really be stars. They want to be celebrities. And that's not what it's about. You've, you are successful in all areas of your professional life. But how would you define success? Oh, look, I could write a book about this. First of all, uh, success to me is being able to go into any bookstore I know or get on the internet, buy any book I want. Yep. Because there were years ago when I lived in London, I would go into Foyle's bookstore, not being able to afford the book and read a chapter during I was munching a sandwich. <laughs> and I would do that every day until I'd read the book. Right? <laughs> I always say to people, remember you don't make yourself a success. The audience makes you successful. I once remember talking to Rock Hudson, a great star, and I took him to dinner in Melbourne with a group of people. And of course, people came up and asked him for an autograph. And, and somebody said, oh, how can you stand that? He said, if it wasn't for those people, I'd still be driving a truck. Mm. And I thought, how, I, I thought that he was a very nice man. And I thought, isn't that great that you have that, that sense of it's the audience that made you a star. You don't make yourself a star. What success is to one person may not be to another. I just know it's given me a wonderful life. I've been able to choose what I want to do. I've been able to I have a great sense of timing. I know when to, to move on. Don't worry about what you did in the past. Only worry about the future. I once interviewed Marlena Dietrich, who was at that stage 124, <laughs> and still going around the world doing this wonderful, glamorous act. And I said to her, Miss Dietrich, something about some film she'd done and whatever. She said, darling, I don't talk about that. It's the past. I talk about the future. And I thought, well, darling, you don't have much of a future left. You're getting on a bit. But that's... And I thought, how wonderful. She, the past is... You can, that's, that's, the future is the interesting test. Territory. It's the unexplored territory. And finally, how would you, in a word only, describe John Michael House in one word? Oh God. In um, one word. Not oh God, not oh God, not God. How would I describe me? <laughs> one word. Enthusiastic. John Michael, thank you very much. Thank you.